My name is Rogier Bos. I'm heading <coughs> the Berlin Hub uh, branch in the Netherlands uh, for the Benelux for the last 10 years. Uh, we've been uh, quite active in these 10 years. We have been uh, especially active in the uh, office market and in the uh, RISI market, been able to build up a significant portfolio. In the meanwhile, we turned to be a green bank, one of the uh, bigger issues of uh, green bonds, uh, especially in Europe, but perhaps uh, all, over the, all over the world. And I'm very glad to sit here in front of you. Great, thanks, Martin. Yeah, Martin Schellein. I'm heading the investment management department at, uh, for Europe at Union Investment. I don't know if you know the company. It's the asset management platform for the cooperative banking sector in Germany. So the German equivalent to Rabobank. And uh, Union <coughs> Investment manages on behalf of private and institutional clients around 340 billion in assets, of which 10% are real estate. And uh, the Netherlands are our fifth biggest market. <coughs> so we own 30 properties, 13 properties in this, um, in this country, mainly offices, uh, three hotels, uh, and a bit of retail. We entered the market back in 2006 when we acquired a minority stake in the Rembrandt Tower from the Dijkhaus family. That's been sold by now, but we will continue to be active in this market. And just last week, uh, bought another nice property in the city. Great. Alexander. Good morning. Um, Alexander Fischbaum, AF Advisory. We do two things. We do debt and deals. Um, mm -hmm. Debt, sometimes our clients come to us and say, we have an asset. Can you please help us finance it? And in the current market, more specifically, clients come to us and say, uh, we can't find anything of particular value. Can you find us something, raise the debt structure so that we can put the equity in and we then run the entire process? Uh, my background is I uh, used to structure funds for ING real estate, so I always have very fond memories coming back here to the Netherlands. Um, then worked in Barclays, where I was head of real estate mezzanine, and then in Orion Capital Managers, where I invested in the UK and Germany, and tried to invest in the Netherlands, de facto in this building here. So I thank you very much for bringing me back to <laughs> what I couldn't in. Uh, get my investment committee to approve. It's really nice of you. Um, so, thank you. And um, we bring all these um, skills together, predominantly focused on the value end of, of transactions. Great, Ron. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, Ron, Ron von Neus. I'm partner at HAVO. Uh, HAVO is a leading consultancy uh, project management and development company in the Netherlands. Uh, we are a part of uh, the TBI holdings. It's the third biggest in the Netherlands with uh, approximately 1.8 billion uh, annual turnover. Um, I'm responsible for all the healthcare and investment uh, uh, transactions uh, for uh, the business. Uh, and since 2012, I'm also uh, a visiting lecturer of the Amsterdam School of Real Estate on the topics of healthcare real estate finance. So. Great, thank you. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, now turning to the most bothering part of uh, this. <laughs> um, this panel. Uh, I'm Hein van der Meer, uh, your host here, as I already introduced. Um, head of legal uh, here, uh, real estate legal uh, in, uh, in, at CMS in the Netherlands. Uh, CMS is part of the worldwide real estate firm. And yeah, we're serving, servicing you all day from this offices, but all over the world uh, on investments, developments, um, and everything which has to do with the real estate business. And I am already working with this firm, proudly to say, for 21, 21 years. Thank you. A lot. Yes. <laughs> you, you started when you were two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Seems absurd. <laughs> Sander. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, um, Sander Breugemans. Uh, my name kind of gives it away, but I'm uh, Dutch. But I started my career in the US uh, in retail and office investments. Joined Prologis back in 2006. So I've been there now for uh, a little over 12 years. For you who don't know Prologis, <coughs> we're a developer, investor, and manager of uh, logistics real estate. Don't do any other uh, asset classes, so only logistics. Active on a worldwide basis, uh, we own about 72 million square meters uh, of real estate across uh, the US, Canada, Mexico, a big part of Asia, and most of the major economies in Europe. Um, we have about 5,000 customers. We're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. I'm responsible for, for our portfolio in the, uh, the Benelux, where we uh, operate about 2 million square meters um, across the major logistics hotspots. Um, so we uh, develop, we acquire land, develop our own buildings, but we also acquire from third parties and our objective is normally to hold a long-term portfolio, manage it and uh, make money that way. Great, good. 
let's just start with you, Martin, if, if we can. Um, we heard there from Samuel, obviously, that the, there's, <clears throat> there's positive growth, particularly in employment, um, there's rental rises. Um, how do you see, I, I suppose, those more economic fundamentals playing into your investment strategy? Um, is that part of the reason for, for looking towards the Netherlands because um, there is limited stock, there is high, high employment? And how do you see, I suppose, the Netherlands within the context of the, the other European markets that you're active in? Well, we're concentrating on the Netherlands, obviously, because it's a star performer. The economy is going to continue to grow uh, for longer and stronger than, for instance, in Germany and, uh, and France, even though there are some dark clouds on the horizon already and all figures are corrected to the negative, I think uh, the Dutch economy is going to continue to outperform um, on a pan-European basis, but also in this city in particular, I think Amsterdam is one of the smallest world cities um, which has I think a global reputation and the connectivity and infrastructure to really um, attract business. And this is what's happening. It, it's happening in Amsterdam. It's not so much happening in the secondary cities where we, we sold out of most of the office markets we were in, in like The Hague um, and other secondary cities and uh, continue to concentrate on Amsterdam because it's more of a city strategy we're running than a country by country strategy. And for offices, I mean, we enter the market here on the south axis at times when we found it hard to underwrite rents much above 300 euros a square meter. We're now at, um, well, depending on who you ask, well above uh, 400, even 450. And that is going to continue to, um, to grow because of a lack of supply still and a healthy demand. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing much more rental growth and the latest acquisition that we did is actually based on a business plan to lease up 40% of uh, vacancy in that building in the historic canal district and I think that is our underwriting today for this market is very positive. Okay good and Rocky in terms of your um, clients who are coming who are coming to you um, what are you seeing in terms of some of the some of the capital um, are they being concerned about the you know the lack of availability of product or the amount, sheer amount of development which we can see going on. What's, uh, what are they seeing? What we, well, <laughs> what we first of all see is that we see more and more still international investors coming to the Netherlands, whilst uh, domestic investors are looking for opportunities and developments. If, well, it's now a bit foggy outside, but um, uh, when I arrived here it was, uh, a bit, it was clear. And um, what you see now that there's actually less cranes than we saw last year. And uh, so it looks a bit like there is a lack of development, even though it also looks like everyone wants to live and work in Amsterdam. Um, so there is definitely some upward potential uh, over there. We uh, seem to need more properties. Uh, so as we also just noted during the presentation that there seems to be a lack of investment uh, product, but also for those uh, companies coming back from London or coming from London uh, looking for uh, a place to work here, it is challenging to, to, to find the right places to work. Uh, so, and I think that's our biggest concern right now. Let's pick up a little bit on the risks. Maybe just, um, Alexander, how do you see at the moment, both within Europe but UK within that context, um, there's obviously Macron in France, there's Merkel to a certain extent, concerns around that that you can read whether or not they're they're you know, correct or not. What's your sense of, of the risk and, uh, and the investors that you're talking to, their, their sense of, of the risk? Yeah, um, we focus predominantly on three countries. That's the UK where we are based, that's Germany for obvious reasons, and the Netherlands because we have very close connections here and have a very positive outlook on the country and I, I share what Martin says. Um, politically, up to re very recently, we just been, uh, came second on a very big London asset because our investors started to dither over the Christmas period um, with all these Brexit negotiations uh, going awry. Um, on the long term, Britain is a strong country. It's going to be fine. Um, I just had a conversation with someone up here in the Netherlands and um, in typically Dutch pragmatic manner, he said to me, well, 
we are watching how this goes out for you and then we're going to think what we're going to do. So there is a little bit of um, broader dissatisfaction in Europe than only in Britain where it manifested itself in a referendum in France and everywhere else. But business um, cannot always wait for the politicians. Leases have to be signed if you want to continue operating your uh, business and that's why in London things have gone very well uh, on the take-up and we don't see these uh, massive exodus and to come back to what you said about the Dutch market we're also very big uh, fans of, of Amsterdam in particular um, our international clients um, they sometimes find it a market that they come after they went to the UK and Germany because it is a smaller market and they need a lot of time to get used to every market so they go to the, the bigger markets first. In addition, um, real estate is a Dutch hobby so all the local investment funds uh, play a very dominant role. So I think the country is really well placed from demand in terms of um, space, logistics and office particularly, and a strengthened internal uh, investment sector that could absorb quite a bit if the international market wasn't so much focused on, on the Netherlands anymore. Okay, good. Um, and Hein, in terms of um, your expectation here in the Dutch market, are you expecting to see a benefit from Brexit in terms of there being more, um, you know, more employment, which is moving maybe from London uh, to here, specifically in Amsterdam? <laughs> Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, you already see that happening eh, with the uh, the medical institute, which is moving uh, here in Amsterdam. And actually, people are looking for housing here in the Netherlands, which is not much available, and here in Amsterdam uh, specifically not. Uh, and further, I expect also uh, bank activity more to shift to um, uh, to to the Netherlands, and specifically again Amsterdam. So those are two examples of uh, Brexit triggering. Um, yeah, activity for, for real estate uh, here, uh, here in the Netherlands. And the other side, of course, uh, that's the dark side, uh, that's the trade, uh, because um, uh, yeah, the Netherlands has a strong uh, connectivity with, uh, with the UK, and because of Brexit, uh, we expect that this, yeah, the trade will drop a little bit, uh, because of extra regulations dropping in, things getting slower. Um, so, yeah, we have positive sides for real estate, but for the, the trade for overall in the Netherlands, uh, Brexit is not a good development. And is that something, obviously in the logistics side, being able to move goods very swiftly is a, is a key part of the business. Um, so is that something that is making you, uh, in a way, I suppose, more positive about the Netherlands market and less positive about the UK from a house view? Or Yes, I think so. I was at a, at a, at a, um, uh, at a lecture in, in London um, in October, and they gave an example about sheep coming to, uh, to, to, to Europe um, and sheep, uh, they need food, uh, they need to also uh, do their thing. Uh, but because of, uh, yeah, let's say, the um, uh, customs and, the, and the, formaliza the formalization again on the board, um, uh, on the borders, they, they expect that this uh, trade of, for instance, sheep will, will drop. On the other hand, uh, because we are here uh, on the other side of the canal, uh, with all the infrastructure we have here in, um, in, in the Netherlands, uh, we expect that Indeed, logistics, the harbor uh, function of, uh, of uh, Rotterdam, Schiphol Airport, uh, they can serve uh, stock coming into, uh, into Europe, and that will block a little bit more Britain because of all customs and, uh, and, and regulation. Yep. So, maybe not great for Prologis UK, but fantastic <laughs> times ahead for you, Sander, by the looks of it. What's, what's the situation in, well, in Benelux at the moment? Yeah, I, th I think a couple of things that are important to mention. Um, I'm not an expert on our UK portfolio, but if you look at a portfolio there, most of our customers are actually very much focused on consumption, local consumption, and people will always need to consume goods. So with that, the demand there will, will stay. Um, I think Brexit is more interesting for us to follow closely to see what it does in terms of the overall European economy and what it means for that. But with that, um, you know, there's always fluctuations in the economy and we're more focused on the structural drivers for logistics. Um, and there's a few things there, they're still very much active active consolidation. So our customers are moving from older, smaller logistics facilities into newer, modern facilities uh, with a greater skill um, for efficiency purposes. And I think in general, in terms of logistics, if you talk to companies, logistics used to be, uh, for many of our customers, a little bit um, 
a necessary evil. They needed a place to store their goods uh, and move boxes from. And now it's become the center of the operations. If you look at Amazon, our biggest customer worldwide, you know, it's all about logistics and everything goes from there. Um, and then of course there's e-commerce, which, uh, which is still growing and which is a rising part <coughs> of our customers. So with that, the economy might fluctuate, but the demand for, um, uh, for logistics structurally is still very good. Discussion there also from Samuel about alternative assets. Healthcare has increasingly been a topic that's been coming up as more of an institutional asset class, concerns over the fact that it's also maybe largely uh, an operating business and that creates risks. Um, just give me um, uh, an update on the sector um, and also how you're seeing it in terms of institutional investment beginning to come into your sector. Well, I'm, I'm actually quite uh, relaxed about it because I'm not interested in Trump or Brexit. I'm only looking at the aging demographics. And these are great, so uh, we think that the healthcare sector will explode and uh, there will be a European investment market in the healthcare business. Um, on one hand, we see the operators, uh, they got a, a large uh, a portfolio of real estate and they have to upgrade them, also from a sustainability perspective. And on the other side, we see some investors who are looking for diversification, yields, uh, investment volume but also for impact investing. And I think uh, then both worlds come together uh, because uh, healthcare is a, a very interesting uh, asset category. Um, and I think the most important thing for investors, is they should know that healthcare has actually two phases. You've got the more specific uh, side, like hospitals, uh, healthcare clinics, uh, private clinics. But when you look at the more uh, residential side, uh, especially uh, the, the elderly people, they want to live in a, in a nice apartment. So uh, we see a shift that healthcare moved towards more residential side. Uh, and then I think it's quite interesting because there's still an, an upside in the investment side for healthcare, uh, long-term uh, leasings, index leases, uh, uh, some uh, 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 found uh, uh, operators. So I think it's quite interesting. And of course, you, you still have to, uh, you've, you've, you've got to know uh, much more about your operator and also about your cash flow. And I think when you, when you know your cash flow, that's the most uh, important guarantee uh, you have uh, for uh, an interesting investment. Okay, good. Um, question coming in, a couple of questions have come in here. How do we expect markets to create new supply to address the stock shortage? Um, because, I, I mean, as Samuel mentioned, a lot of that capital is looking for core. Um, so are there kind of safe areas for growth was the question really in terms of, I mean, uh, so I, I suppose maybe start with you, Martin, just in terms of the strategy. Um, how, how are you adjusting that or have you adjusted that either within the cycle? Um, are, are you taking a slightly more defensive position, whether that's, less retail, more logistics, more, you know, more of a focus on different types of office? I think what I'm going to tell you about this uh, is in line with many, with the investor sentiment in general, because we are going to downsize <coughs> our retail portfolio. Yeah. There will be no fire sales, but if, you, if I look at my five to 10 year planning horizon, I see more retail sales or sales of retail properties, um, going on, we're going to strengthen the logistics um, <coughs> sector for obvious reasons, and we are underweight on this. And uh, I guess we'll always have a share of minimum 50% of offices. Um, but we will continue to really focus on the growth spots. It's gateway cities, it's star performing cities. We're not going to go to secondaries, we're not going to go astray for that sector. And we are looking at residential as well and uh, also including the Netherlands, which is, uh, is a very healthy market these days. Okay, good. Um, and anyone else can pick that up. So, um, yeah, Rocky, go ahead. Yeah, I think most of the Dutch investors will tell you <coughs> that they would be focusing at the quality of the assets. Um, uh, there is uh, obviously a lack of supply, there's a lack of good product, but good product uh, to lease out will always be uh, in demand. So this is also the time to invest in the properties that you actually already have uh, in order to compete in the future. It's kind of a defensive strategy uh, also in order to be ready for the, uh, 
be for the future. But uh, and it fits, by the way, our strategy as a, as, a, as a family bank, where we like to have assets that are well relatable, that can be used altern alternatively, and which have a future even in, in case of a downturn. Yeah. And uh, that is actually in line with what the Dutch market would be doing. So you see a stronger focus on core or hard core properties. Core or perhaps less core properties on less uh, strong locations, which are simply well managed and well developed. Mm. Uh, a, uh, a good asset in a secondary city uh, can be very attractive, can probably give you a better yield and uh, will have less local competition because you will be mm -hmm. one of the few only one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you have to reconsider your strategy, uh, Onion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about this because uh, in the Netherlands we predominantly raise and structure finance and I think that's also merit Martin's uh, approach in, in the banking sector. So we've been working on um, hotels. Um, Ori and I looked at a very good logistics center in development. We have always had, as long as the asset is good, core-ish, the location um, and operations, very strong demand for finance from national and international banks. So the, the Dutch banking market has recovered tremendously from its difficult days. And international lenders, as OJ, have come back in force. So there's a very competitive market. Um, if you go to the more difficult to understand sectors, we are working on a partly vacant um, data center, for example. The number of banks is not measured in the dozens, but you can count them on one hand and you don't need all fingers. So that informs also the ability of the investor and the developer what actually he can get off the ground with the um, help of a bank and not all equity. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> let's let's drill down a little bit into some of the sectors. Um, let's look at logistics. Um, in terms of some of the bigger trends, um, what are you seeing um, that's coming from the states, from Prologis, and also uh, maybe from the UK? How, how are e-commerce? Um, trends. How are you seeing them, and what are you expecting to see in the in the Netherlands and Benelux because of that? Got it. Um, well, I think on logistics, a few, a couple things. Uh, one is more on the investment side, and um, that really comes down to the fact that when I started in the industry 12 years ago, logistics real estate it wouldn't have been on Samuel's uh, presentation, for example. You had retail, you had office, and what was logistics? Uh, there were only a couple parties doing it. And that has completely changed. The, the amount of institutional capital that is available nowadays for, for logistics is huge. And I think every institutional investor wants to have part of his capital allocated towards logistics. So that's, that's one change that is definitely uh, there to stay. When it comes to more recent trends, um, and it's definitely e-commerce is a big one. And we do expect e-commerce sales in Europe to double over the next five years. So that will be a huge demand driver. Um, I think one of the things that we're still trying to figure out in logistics um, and I think it's starting now in US, UK, and, and then coming to at least the big cities in, in Europe, is the whole last mile, last touch um, um, challenge. How do you get, uh, you know, consumers, they want their product anytime, anywhere, and how do we facilitate that? It used to be quite simple, you know, you had a, a manufacturer who brought a, a product to a distribution center, from there it went to a retailer, and people went to the stores and they acquired it. And now you have products coming from a distribution center still to the retailer, but also direct, directly to the consumer, also coming back again from the consumer, reverse logistics, logistics because the product is not right. There's all these flows, so the sector's got a much more complicated. And especially that last mile, how do you get it to the people in the center of Amsterdam? Um, I still don't think we have fully figured out how that's gonna work. I do see now the first investments in the US in um, also double or triple layer to distribution centers in the middle of the city. Uh, we're doing our first investments now also um, if in, uh, in Paris and in London in the same schemes, sometimes even redeveloping old office facilities to logistics, which is a very interesting trend. Um, and let's see if it also takes a hold in Amsterdam. I've um, got a question in here as well, specific on, on logistics, so let's pick that up, um, which is about do you see risk to the sector given recent negative headlines about some of the, the, the key kind of pure play e-commerce players, ASOS, Zalando. Um, uh, is that the start of an unwinding of some of these business models? Um, or how, how do you see that as a developer? Yeah, it's a really good one. Um, I mean, it is something, especially over Christmas time, there were quite some articles there 
and that is something that we're following very closely. I think what we can do as a developer and as an investor um, is really, and I echo that, invest in our existing assets also. And an example is a facility that we have in the Tilburg area that we're developing now with a well-building certificate. And I'm not so much talking about just sustainability measures because I think everybody's doing that. But we're much more focused on what does it mean for the people working in the warehouse. Uh, I mean, um, um, if you look at labor, that's about 50% of the cost of our customers. Um, real estate is only 5%, so very small. Um, so when we create, can create extra daylight, when we can create plants in the facility, when we look at uh, products that, um, um, product uh, uses of materials that are good for the environment, uh, when you look at air circulation, those are the things that we can uh, improve on. And that makes it more pleasant for the people working in the warehouses, because I do think that it's going to be key, um, not just in terms of uh, media exposure, but also for our customers to get and keep their employees. Just in terms of the, picking up the point that you said there, Martin, um, Roger, are you also seeing um, generally a downturn in investor sentiment for retail, less people coming to you for, for retail assets, or is there a difference between, let's say, core retail um, and secondary retail? What, what are people coming to you for? Yeah, retail, retail is in a, for financing still in demand, um, but it's a bit of a particular asset class since there are several sub-asset classes. And I was just thinking about Sander's statement about the, uh, the last mile. I mean, basically, the last mile is already there, and it's called a shop. Um, question is, why doesn't that work as we want it to be? Uh, perhaps there are other reasons. Is it because um, uh, consumer confidence has been dropping a bit? That, by the way, the political instability that we see here and there is perhaps also caused by that. So you may wonder what, are, what the real drivers are of the issues that we see with, uh, with retail. It can also be the growing population funding healthcare. It can also uh, be, uh, again, the fact that uh, capital uh, can, may perhaps be a bit reallocated. Um, this morning there was a little publication about retail in Utrecht. We, we, uh, it was described uh, that the actually turnovers in uh, a couple of shopping centers have been turned down, apart from the ones in the center. And um, that is an area which, uh, which is an attractive, an attractive place to be which is exactly how modern shopping centers are being de developed at the moment. Um, so uh, the way we look at it, we can uh, finance uh, assets uh, um, perhaps there in, in city centers and high streets, and uh, perhaps uh, supermarkets, which are also still developing. So these are the, the two, let's say, sub-asset classes that we are currently focusing on. But I'm actually curious about your view on the last mile uh, being a shop somewhere. That's a very interesting one. I do, I do think that it's, um, my personal view is, is that um, what the future will be be more, be more of an omni-channel um, logistics solution. So I do think you're right that the solution, parts of the solution for the last mile might be shops where, you know, and you already see it with, for example, one of our biggest customers in the Netherlands is Cool Blue. Um, they, um, if you order something there, it will come out of our 100,000 square meter facility in Tilburg. But they're also opening up shops because people want the experience, they want to test products, and they might still order it in the shop online. But I think that uh, that combination of retail and, and, off and, and logistics will be much more integrated. Yeah. And the question being, will it look like a locker room? Or is it going to be more of a shelf, a presentation of product? So I think that's, uh, that's going to be an interesting I don't change. believe it's going to look like a locker room because yeah, no one will come there. No, but Three. people order and mm -hmm. people pick up. Yeah. Uh, on the last mile shops, I mean, they do exist, these locker rooms. And uh, you pick up your own um, product, which you ordered online, but it might also be part of a presentation. I, I can imagine that, that these spheres will somehow merge. A shop with a pickup uh, space for the goods that you ordered. Well, you have in the UK, certainly, and you may have it yeah. here, Argos which I'm uh, sure Alexander will be familiar with. Samuel obviously is. Um, but interestingly, uh, I've started using that more because there's one that I can walk to, which means that actually I can just reserve it and pick it up in three minutes, as opposed to waiting for two hours or whatever it is for Amazon. And I get less packaging, so I feel better about myself and I've walked, which is mm -hmm. also good. <laughs> um, so it would be interesting because that was desperately unfashionable. 
and being replaced by Amazon. I wonder whether there'll be an element of, of mm -hmm. things coming back round, that it's still actually a logistics challenge because mm -hmm. you've got to move it in between all of those shops. But um, And the other thing that's interesting, I think, is the um, Amazon Go, 3,000 stores opening in the US. Obviously, Amazon changing towards also being a, a, a shop in a way that people can go into. Do you see those lines blurring more? Um, definitely, I, I, I definitely see that. Um, the example I took with Cool Blue, I think, is a good one for that. But indeed, Amazon as well. Um, I mean, a lot of the products that they're delivering in, in New York and London are within the next hour already. Um, and I think that the people's expectations on, on when it comes to consumption, on how we expect our product to be at the place where we want it to be at the time where we want it to be, that's going not going to be changed back. Um, so. Um, I think that's going to stay. I do think people still like to have the experience. Uh, they like to try products or see it, for certain products at least. So with that, yeah, there has to be that, that merger of retail and logistics to a certain extent. Um, I'll just pick up that little point on logistics, because the, uh, on, on experience, because actually there's, a, there's a, um, a question which has appeared at the top, so it must have had some likes, uh, which is, will changing habits, so e-commerce, flexible working, um, co-working, co-living, um, as that sort of world evolves, will we need so many buildings, and particularly as humans move from a focus on assets to a focus on experience? Quite a big question to be asking, but I like it. <laughs> what, what do we think? Is that a question to me? Could I be a question to, to everyone. Yeah, I, think, yes. <laughs> I was <laughs> looking at it you. Was. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of uh, but I think the assets will just look different. I mean, a WeWork space looks different from a Riga space. I'm... Um, more worried about the performance of the whole sector. I mean, take, take Amsterdam. Take Amsterdam has the highest percentage of flex and co-working space in any European city, even ahead of London. Uh, so that's, um, and it's the TMT sector sort of is, is a broad part of the occupier base in this city. So if there is a, a potential disruption yeah, or a downturn in the economy, that might well affect the office market. Yeah. And then some concepts will survive, some will not. And uh, I think it's all about market leadership in this sector right now. And there is uh, clearly a front runner. Yeah. But uh, the whole sector is going to evolve and not all of these uh, concepts will survive. I mean, we've, we've seen it before. <coughs> and in, in some European cities, the, the flex space, co-working market has, such, has gained such a big share that is actually going to affect the office market as such. Now, it could be, it's sort of a gray market like you have in London with sublettings and, um, and it can well have uh, an effect on the rest of the office market as well. Will people want to work there and even shop and live in, in, a, in, a, in an environment um, that is uh, offering all these uses? I think that's that's going to be the big question for this sector. I mean, what will it look like? And what it's all about experience, people. And, and boring uh, concepts, they will die. And the need for flex space and co-working could be different in a different economic environment. So these are all factors, I think, to look at. Uh, but what interests me most is which, which will be the winning concept, because there are so many by now. And I think I'd like to add to this. Uh, I fully agree with Martin. I think, yes, we will need, uh, or the demand for office space through co-working will change more dramatically depending on the economic cycle. Because if you have a world, or if you had a world where there are only large corporates locked into 10-year leases, if the cycle doesn't fall at the end of the lease, the space will stay occupied and the large corporate will pay the rent even if it's vacant. We've seen this in London in the 1990s where swathes of buildings were empty and HSBC or whoever else just continue to pay the bill because that was my contractual obligation. Um, smaller corporations uh, neither have the balance sheet um, and also in the co-working sector have much shorter leases. So you say stand at a situation where the overall building that a WeWork or whoever else may have let has a long lease obligation and the 
operator has a payment obligation to the owner of the building, the investor, but doesn't derive or potentially derives much less income because they ha the tenants have annual, monthly, whatever else leases they have and may have in difficult economic environments to make the decision, do I keep my fancy expensive office, do I downsize, do I keep space for future staff or do I go home and work at my kitchen desk? And this is the last extreme. Uh, so I think much of the take up in many cities um, has been carried forward by um, serviced office providers, driven by the exceptionally good economic cycle. Mm -hmm. And what Mark, uh, Martin just mentioned as a shakeout uh, will, in my opinion, also lead to some busts of the weaker concepts. And you will have landlords who have a building that is 100% led to a serviced office operator who can't survive anymore because his desk paying individuals are not there anymore. We're not, as, as union, we're not looking critically at the sector, but we're very critically looking at the financial strength of our tenants who are buying long and selling short. And then because we had it before in Germany around the turn of the century uh, when the dot-com bubble burst, we had Regus and we were probably one of the biggest landlords in Germany uh, with Regus and uh, some of the people uh, who have lived through these times at Union, they will tell you that we helped Regus survive. They wouldn't exist without Union granting them rent discounts and big time back then in Germany. And it was sort of a, yeah, a similar situation, um, or let's say a similar start to a situation as you could imagine uh, right now. Uh, because uh, it's a lot of flex space co-working on offer. The uh, sector is expanding rapidly. At the same time, the economies are going down in most uh, countries. The TMT sector is particularly strong as an occupier for this type of space. And it's by some considered to be the most overvalued sector um, on the stock market. So that's, that's kind of a, a situation that was there before, end of the 90s in a way. And do you then, a question, do you then allow readers or spaces which we have here in Amsterdam, allow them to, to enter into contract with turnover rent uh, principles? Is that a concept you, because not, you see not a concept, investors doing? Yeah, not a concept um, that we can build your... Really, no, we, we cannot build our cash flows no. on it. And we have certain restrictions by German investment law uh, to uh, base our income on operating profit of companies. So we have to have a fixed lease yeah. at, a, at a fixed rent. Maybe there are turnover elements with hotels and, uh, and retail properties, but only to a certain extent that we can manage that from a legal perspective. And again, the banking falls in again behind this because some of the large operators, we worked on some uh, in London. And first of all, the terms they demand in rent freeze and um, fit out uh, contributions are significant. And so the bank gets already a bitty cash, a cash flow and then looks at the covenant strength. And you will find again the same that um, not all operators and not all leases are easily to finance. And it will very much depend, if you strip away everything, what building am I left with this, if this company doesn't exist uh, at some point during my loan. Yeah. Is it a good building in the end? And that's what it's all about. It's about the yeah. asset. Uh, we have been, a couple of years ago, we tried to uh, estimate the number of square meters here in the Netherlands that we actually need in the future. And to be honest, I haven't spoken to anyone yet who has been able to answer that question. <laughs> Having said that, you have seen what happened to occupancy rates here in Amsterdam uh, over the past years, which is caused by uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of elements. Uh, urbanization is one of them. Taking uh, stock out of the market is uh, is one of them. We see that uh, flexible working, so not co-working, but flexible working, was expected to um, to generate uh, a lower demand for square meters. In fact, what you see is those uh, companies that uh, exercise flex working uh, would like to have a bit more because everyone is in there on the same days, on the same uh, time. So of course, I mean your. Your question has a very high level of uh, accuracy if you want to go uh, to go further on it. But for the time being, it looks like uh, all these new ways of working are not really leading to a, a higher vacancy. I think it will be a focus on central locations for office buildings mainly. That's what I can uh, refer to. Um, location will be critical. Infrastructure, connectivity, 
Yeah, because in a sharing economy, less people will travel by car. Even in the Netherlands, that's what I would predict, even though there is a certain stickiness in this country. <laughs> you stick with your cars, but uh, I think um, a parking garage on the <laughs> south axis will probably be used differently in, uh, in 10, 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. and, there, and connectivity by um, public transport is, I think, a key element of, uh, of a location strategy for not, not only offices, other asset classes as well. I think it all comes down to the economics, the, uh, the wide economy and the performance of the wide economy and affordability. If you expect your business to continue well, you let larger space and fit in people afterwards. If not, you size down. If as a private household, you are very concerned about the development of your income, you might not take out a mortgage, you might rent a smaller space. Microliving is uh, an example in Germany because affordability is so stretched. People want more space, but they simply can't afford it. And that turns then back in how much space do we need? Because if every individual um, in England is extreme in this because the minimum square meter, which I don't think is 100% precisely defined to put it politely, um, you get smaller and smaller um, houses. And that means the total square meter that you need, that, that you occupy is less. It's not what people need is less, but what you occupy less. And that's true for the office sector, and that's true for the um, residential sector. A hotel also, you have different sized hotel rooms and different sized concepts. Again, affordability, economy and affordability. Those are the two drivers. Logistics, I think we have someone who's much better uh, placed than me to comment, but I think there is a, a shift in shopping behaviors that overlays everything else, and that contradicts this, because if you stop Buying in a shop, affordability of the shop goes down and the shop will go, and you have it more delivered, then the affordability and the economics for this um, logistics space increase. But the two drivers, where's our economy heading, where's affordability heading, that's, that's one of the simple truths in real estate, those things drive it. Um, I want to make sure that there's enough time for some networking afterwards and, and questions, so a couple of quick far ones. Um, Ron, just in terms of the investors that are coming to you, there's, there's obviously been um, a, a large trend that we've seen over the past 12 months, six months especially, um, about people moving towards a concept of um, not just residential or student housing or micro living, but actually just putting it into a box of living, uh, which also then includes senior living and extends into healthcare. Um, is that how you're seeing your businesses as, as part of that? And are institutional investors seeing that as well? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you also see that the, the sizes of the tickets are increasing. So uh, one of your questions, where there is healthcare interest for institutional investors, I think because of the, uh, we are going from asset to portfolio <coughs> deals. Uh, we're talking about not 10 million, but up to 100 million uh, uh, deals. Um, and I think, it's, and we're talking about economic drivers, uh, then go into healthcare because it's driven by the aging demographics. And I've, I think that's why it's so uh, much interesting for uh, investors. It's about the guarantee of the cash flow. So and we can forecast our aging uh, population. So it's quite simple. Thank you. Sp speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll Sound be coming like a broker. to you soon. Yeah, no, it's not like a broker. Yeah, sorry, I'm not a broker. <laughs> um, and just quickly on the uh, on the capital flow side, um, interesting from the slides there um, that you there was a drop in Middle Eastern money. I noticed, um, but also interestingly in in the events that we had in uh, in Paris and and in Warsaw, um, very much over the beginning of this year, there'd been increasing. Um, calls from Middle Eastern investors um, again. So I don't know whether, is anybody else seeing that in this in this market? You are, okay. I, is that, is that I, the I same thing? That that that. We, see, we see it here as well from, of course, initially from Korea, but also from the Middle East. So I could not really recognize those numbers on, uh, on, on screen. Uh, it could be a coincidence perhaps, but uh, that is defi definitely a sign of last year. So, last question from me is, uh, you know, where should we where should we invest? What do we learn from this? I'm, I'm feeling, I'm yeah, feeling like, uh, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to say? Um, let's uh, let's let's start with you, Roger. So, wh 
where do you think... Uh, what do you find it? Yeah. <laughs> That's the question. Yeah, well, you can decide whether it's where you would finance. Yeah, what would, uh, where do you think the opportunities are? Yeah, your 500 million uh, question. Um, we, uh, I, I think I, I would underline well already what I just said. Um, there, I would invest in qualitative good assets in secondary locations in order to get more yield than you might be able to get here in Amsterdam, um, offering your tenants a good reliability. And that may as well be offices. Okay, good. Martin? I would rather invest in second-class buildings in prime locations than the other way around. Not mm -hmm. for yield, for sustainability. This is mm -hmm. what we're looking for. Sustainability of cash flows and also the rationale of getting your money back when you have to invest in buildings. The higher the rent, the more money you're getting back from your capex expenditures. I think this second is... Second-class buildings in prime locations. Rather than first-class buildings in secondary cities or secondary locations because I think there is more uh, continued value in this. You can bring them up to speed. You can mm -hmm. always invest because you get normally higher rents than for a prime building in a secondary city or a secondary location. And I think a buildings age ever more quickly than they did before. So location, I think, for me will always be crucial. And and he, we, we even tore buildings down and built them anew, and they were perfect business cases if the location was right. You could never do that in a secondary location. And, and also, what I, what I told about the Netherlands, we really um, didn't see much uh, value creation in the secondary uh, office markets compared to Amsterdam. But Amsterdam's been a star performer, so uh, we are going to continue uh, to concentrate on on A locations in A cities, basically leave the um, uh, yeah or the or the special asset classes to the specialists and and maybe strengthen the exposure to uh, logistics if if we may amongst the big players, and and also focus on residential because residential is probably uh, the best hedge uh, for the next cycle to come. Okay, good, Alexander. Um, yeah, what have we put to our clients? They were all office buildings. Um, that doesn't mean there's no opportunity in others, but we just like things that are imperfect. Location and things that you can't change have to be good, but everything else, refurbish it, retenant it, you have um, underperforming tenants that you can move around. We even looked at a retail uh, warehouse park that um, we can subdivide, change part of it to logistics and stuff like this. In an environment where yields are so low, we focus exclusively on value creation opportunities where we can do something hands-on, come with a, up with an asset management plan before we buy it and then try to implement that afterwards because <coughs> we don't like to um, be in control, uh, we don't like the market to be in control of our destiny. We like to shape it ourselves a little bit. Okay, good. Ron. I'm going to guess. <laughs> no, don't guess. <laughs> well, offices. offices. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I would. <laughs> 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 That's a good hedge. Smart, if things don't work out, <laughs> a, a graveyard. New market there. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, now I would say uh, focus on the impact of your investment, and maybe healthcare is a good one. Okay. What do I have to say? Um, I step a little bit out of the box because um, uh, yesterday I, I read a, a column in, uh, in Property NL uh, from Jeppe de Boer. I don't know if, you, if you've read it already. I'm also with a column in the same Property NL, <laughs> so read that. Uh, but this is about, uh, also about long-term focus. And he advised basically to invest in beach houses in Somalia. <laughs> uh, that's the first one. And the second one in larger hotels in the Alps, but not for the winter, but the summer, because the winters will disappear. Because the people from China and the Far East will come, and they will come to the Alps, and they will come to Somalia to enjoy the sun and the beaches over there. So that's over 10 years, because he expects in 15 years uh, to end this, uh, that residential demand will vanish away here from the Netherlands, and then you move elsewhere, and that will be Somalia. Okay. Thank you. Does it it doesn't sound like you'll be competing too much there in terms of strategies, Martin. Not exactly. <laughs> Sad can you actually acquire property there? Yes. yes. Not yet, but he's expecting in 15 years that economics will come up. <laughs> I change. Sure. You need good guards. Can you keep it there? Exactly. But I, I, I can guarantee you the yields are now 25%. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sandra, anything in Somalia for you? No, I think we'll skip on Somalia for now. Um, logistics? No, because of course I have to say logistics, but um, I think a couple of things there. Um, I think if you look at the spreads for logistics towards the other asset classes, it's still very attractive. Um, yields have compressed, of course, but the spread is still there. And what we're seeing now, it started in US, UK, and now continental Europe, it's rental growth. So that's really where the value creation will come from in the next, uh, next few years. In terms of what within logistics, I actually agree with you that um, what we focus on is still the, the core locations. And uh, I like going up the risk curve, but then in terms of what in terms of building quality or vacant buildings or um, buildings that need a lot of capex, um, if it's a building on the right location and you can make it into a generic building, happy to take the leasing risk on that. Uh, because the A location is also the location that if the economy goes into a downturn again, we'll always lease it. So mm -hmm. that'll be my recommendation. Okay, good. Thank you, everybody.